Right, here we go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I can see you coming through on my little uh, vidi printer, as it were. Um, I'm Steve Smedley, as many of you know, uh, Acuity Associate. Um, welcome to a one-off webinar um, that picks up where we left off um, with Rob from the um, RSH uh, just before Christmas. Um, so yeah, welcome back, Rob. Um, he's uh, Assistant Director of Business Intelligence uh, at The Regulator. So he's gonna be building on the previous session. For those of you that were at it, that, that session set out the broad direction of uh, consumer regulation, um, uh, which was based on a document that the regulator issued uh, around about November time. Uh, he also kind of covered where the TSMs uh, fitted into that broad um, thrust of consumer regulation and set out some of the high level thinking around the TSMs as well. So this session, uh, because that, that previous session took place just before the regulator issued their consultation on the TSMs, so this is the session where we can all get stuck into some of the detail of that consultation um, and get some clarification and stuff from Rob. So before I hand over to Rob, uh, just the usual uh, tedious housekeeping issues. Uh, this webinar is scheduled to last for an hour. If you've got a tech issue during the session, use the chat function to get in touch with James. Uh, James, give him a wave. There he is. Um, so any tech issues um, with your sound or whatever, and vision, as David Bowie would say, uh, James is your man using the chat function. If you've got questions for Rob, though, use the Q&A tool uh, at the bottom of your toolbar um, uh, to pose lovely, succinct, to the point questions for, uh, for Rob to answer. I will sift through those questions and put them verbally to Rob so that everyone can benefit from understanding the question as well as the answer. Um, we, um, we will be taking questions um, at the end. Um, so, uh, but, but by all means, just put them on as we go. Uh, if there are any points of clarification as Rob's going through, I'll sift through those and put them uh, to Rob um, as we go. But otherwise, I'll be hoovering up the questions right at the end. Um, a recording of this uh, will be available uh, for you to refer back to and for any of your colleagues to uh, check out who couldn't make it today. We also have a recording of Rob's um, previous session, um, uh, the one that took place just before Christmas on the website as well. And that's it from me. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it's um, over to you, Rob. That's great. Cheers. Thanks very much, Steve. And um, thanks for inviting me back um, to talk about our now ongoing uh, tenant satisfaction measure consultation. Um, as Steve said, when I last came along um, to talk to you shortly before Christmas, um, it was a little bit before we launched the consultation, so I wasn't able to set out um, all of the detail of what we were proposing at that point. It mainly focused on the background. Um, I've included a little bit of the background material in here again, so uh, apologies to anyone that was at the previous session has heard some of that before, um, but I think it's important context um, for the detail that follows. And then the uh, the bulk of the presentation focuses on the uh, the detail of what's in the um, the consultation itself, um, a bit of an explanation of why we're proposing what we're proposing, um, and then there'll be an opportunity to um, discuss at the end. So just a little bit of introductory context. Um, it's now a year and a bit um, since the government published the social housing white paper which amongst other things set out a series of proposals for more proactive consumer regulation by um, the regulator of social housing. Over that year and a bit um, we've been doing a lot of work at the regulator to begin to develop our approach to the new proactive consumer regulation regime. We've set out three broad tests um, to apply to all of our developing thinking about consumer regulation. So we want everything that we do to make a meaningful difference to tenants. We want it to be deliverable by social landlords themselves. And it, we want it to be something that we are actually capable of regulating. 
we're focusing on four main areas um, at the moment. So firstly, the principles and outcomes. So what do we want to achieve through the new consumer regime? Probably the most important element is the uh, new consumer standards. Um, we're a standards based regulator. Um, that's the basis of everything that we do. They set the requirements that social landlords are expected to follow. Um, so we're going to be reviewing all of our existing consumer standards and revising those in due course. And they will be the, the foundation of the new regime when it comes into effect. Thirdly, we're looking at our regulatory approach. So how will we operationalize this? What will we do in practice? Which will include developing our detailed proposals on some of the ideas set out in the white paper, uh, like consumer inspections, desktop reviews. Um, and finally, the area that we're developing fastest and the area that we're consulting on at the moment um, is the tenant satisfaction measures. So the, the consumer KPIs that were proposed by the white paper. On background on those measures themselves, there were, there were two objectives for them. Um, firstly, um, as a tool for tenants to improve transparency over how their landlord is doing. And secondly, as a source of regulatory intelligence for us, uh, the regulator of social housing, to identify those areas where we might need more assurance on how landlords are doing. The expectation set by the white paper was that the TSM should follow the five themes that were established in the social housing green paper, um, which were keeping properties in good repair, maintaining building safety, the effective handling of tenants' complaints, respectful and helpful tenant engagement, um, and finally, responsible neighbourhood management, which includes the management of antisocial behaviour. We've done a lot of preparatory work over the year or so between the publication of the white paper and the launch of our consultation in December. Um, a lot of that was spent focusing on developing an evidence base. So we've looked very carefully at what's already in use in the sector, the likes of the house mark, what Acuity do themselves, what past regulators have done in uh, previous regimes in England, what our counterparts in Scotland already do to try and identify what works well, what doesn't work quite so well. We put a lot of effort into trying to define terms and minimise the inconsistencies and differences in meaning that could potentially sneak into the definitions in use in designing the TSMs to minimize the scope for any ambiguity and confusion. We've looked very carefully at what we already collect in terms of regulatory information, um, including what we get into our existing regulatory returns to try and minimize the scope of duplication, overlap and any confusion there. And an area that we've thought long and hard about is a, a sort of tricky balancing act between on the one hand having enough prescription in our proposals that we can try and encourage comparability of results between different providers on the one hand versus on the other the principle set out in our, our um, founding statute about co-regulation minimizing interference and trying to control the burden on providers themselves. And finally, we've done an awful lot of work with stakeholders to test out some of the emerging propositions. So we set up a sounding board, um, which in included landlords from both the housing association and local authority sector, their representative bodies, um, representative tenant groups. And we've had a lot more kind of one-to-one -one engagement as well with different organizations, sector experts, and run a series of tenant workshops as well. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work to try and road test some of the end proposals before they were published in the consultation document. As part of that work, we developed a set of principles to guide us um, in the development of the measures themselves. Um, and it's worthwhile spending a little bit of time on these because they've, they've helped inform a lot of what's in our consultation paper. The first of those is that we want everything that we produce to be relevant to the two aims of the white paper. So use as a tool for tenants and use as a tool for us as the regulator. We recognize that in some cases, a particular measure might work better for one of those purposes than the other, but ideally we want them to work for at least one and ideally both of those objectives. We obviously want the data that comes back to be accurate, and there's a number of things that we'll need to achieve to do that. We need all of the measures to be well-defined to minimize the scope for ambiguity. Associated with that, we want the results to be comparable across different landlords. A lot of the measures will rely on surveying tenants themselves, 
which means we need a robust and comparable methodology to be conducting those surveys to make sure that all landlords are doing it on a broadly comparable basis. We want the results to come out to be as far as possible objective, so minimise the scope for subjectivity and in interpretation of what the results mean. An issue that tenants have told us they're concerned about is the scope for gaming. So we're looking to try and minimise that as far as we can. And we want to make sure that the results are as far as possible verifiable. So if we, the regulator or anyone else, needs to go back and see how the results have been compiled and produced, we can go and do that. We want to make sure that the results are responsive. And what we mean by that is responsive to the actions of the landlord, um, and ideally responsive to the actions of the landlord in a positive way. So we don't want to incentivize landlords to do anything that's undesirable in terms of the outcomes for the tenant. We want to try and minimize perverse incentives. Um, and we also want to make sure that the results are attributable to the actions of the landlord, um, because ultimately that is the body that we regulate. There are some parts of the pro suites and measures where they're potentially a bit tricky, um, particularly around neighbourhoods and antisocial behaviour, um, because some organisations will have a greater degree of control over the results in those areas. And there are potentially multiple different agencies with a role, for example, or the landlords, the local authority, the police and so on. But as far as possible, we want to tease out the contribution made by the organisation that we regulate. Um, and finally, under that header, we want to make sure that the data is reasonably timely, so it's capturing the performance of the landlord in the recent past rather than the, the dim and distant past. And then finally, we want to make sure that the whole exercise is deliverable. It's unlikely to be cost free. Um, it's going to mean a lot of landlords doing things slightly differently compared to what they do at the moment. But we recognise that the money for this ultimately comes from either the taxpayer or from tenants' rents. So as far as possible, we want to make sure that the exercise offers value for money and is cost effective as possible. Um, and finally, we don't want to create a great cumbersome data architecture. We want to try and make this as smooth and easy as possible. So the consultation itself, um, the foundation of everything that we're consulting on at the moment um, is a draft new consumer standard, a draft TSM standard. At the moment, it's not a regulatory requirement that anybody has to do this. Um, so we need to make it one before we can implement the measures. Um, and that's what the draft TSM standard sets out to do. It's relatively short and sweet. Um, and you can see the, the core proposals on this slide. So basically, um, it sets out requirements that landlords need to collect information on their performance against the TSMs to publish it annually, including an explanation of how they've met our requirements, to submit that information to us at the regulator annually, um, and to affirm and ensure that the information is accurate, reliable, valid, and a transparent reflection of the organization's performance against the TSMs. As I've said, in due course, we're going to be reviewing all of our consumer standards. And this consultation is going out in advance of that wider exercise, which will follow in due course. So what will emerge from this process will be an interim position that will introduce the TSM requirement before we revise the rest of the standards. We'll then need to review again as part of that wider review. And there may be subsequent changes to where it's located in the regulatory framework. So this is an interim position um, that will introduce the requirement and then maybe tweaked a little bit with that wider review in a couple of years time. Probably the element I think most people are most interested in um, in the consultation is what we're proposing in terms of the, um, the TSMs themselves. We have consulted on 22 um, different metrics spread across those five themes which were set out in the white paper. Um, there are a couple of areas where there were individual proposals set out in the white paper itself where we've deferred consulting for the time being. Um, that's because the government has got concurrent policy development work going on in those areas. Um, so they've said they're going to um, do a review of electrical safety standards in the social housing sector. And there's an ongoing review of the decent home standard, which may affect some of the requirements around communal areas. So we didn't think it made sense to consult on those two measures 
until the government had pinned down what the underlying policy requirements were going to be. So we've held off on those two um, and we'll, if necessary, consult on those again in due course, which leaves us with the 22 that we're consulting on at the moment. We're looking at an overarching headline measure of tenant satisfaction with the overall service, um, which should be familiar to most people. It's not that dissimilar to what Housemark use at the moment. Um, and then we've got four measures proposed under the theme of keeping properties in good repair. Two of these are management information measures and two of them tenant perception measures which would rely on surveying tenants themselves. On the management information side, um, we've got a measure of the uh, number of homes that don't meet the current decent home standard. That's intended to be exactly the same as the requirements we currently collect in the, um, the SDR for consistency. And we're also looking at a um, measure on repairs completed within the organization's target timescale, which would mean needing to report what that target timescale is as well, so that it's um, comprehensible to the reader. And we're also proposing two complementary tenant perception measures to see what tenants think of performance in this area. So one on overall satisfaction with the repairs service, which is intended to give a, a view of the satisfaction with the quality of the service. And a second measure focused on satisfaction with the time taken to complete the most recent repair. Um, we did toy with the idea of using the right first time concept in this, um, but decided against it um, for consultation based on the feedback that we had from engagement with tenants and landlords and they are preparatory work. Um, we came to the conclusion that it was pretty complex. It was quite difficult to define exactly what you meant in a consistent way. Um, and a lot of organizations mean slightly different things by it and tenants have slightly different understandings of what it means. So in the interest of comparability, we've gone for the two measures that we're proposing here, as opposed to trying to focus on right first time. Under the theme of maintaining building safety, as I said, we're proposing to defer the electrical safety measure for the time being, but that would leave us with five um, management information measures for the moment on gas, fire, asbestos, water, and lift safety. In each of those cases, we're proposing having a measure based on the completion of the necessary statutory safety checks. And we're proposing doing that on what we're calling a dwelling basis. So we're looking to try and capture the measurement based on the number of individual properties that are affected by the checks or not. And that is in recognition of the fact that some of these checks could affect one or two properties or potentially 50 or 100. So just focusing on the number of checks completed doesn't necessarily give either us or tenants an idea of the potential magnitude of an issue and whether you know, a failure to complete a given check affects one property or 100. So we're proposing doing that on the basis of the individual dwellings. And then to complement those, we're ha proposing having a single tenant satisfaction measure in this space on satisfaction with whether the home is well maintained and safe to live in. Uh, the, the knack in this one is going to be defining that one correctly to make sure that everybody is clear about what the question is actually getting at and whether we're talking about the safety of the individual property or whether it brings in safety of the wider neighborhood, for example. We're proposing four measures under handling of complaints. Um, again, um, two perception, two management information. Um, there'll be a headline um, measure of the number of complaints received in the year relative to the size of the landlord um, and a measure of the number of those complaints which were responded to within the Ombudsman's Complaint Handling Code timescales. On both of those, we have tried as far as possible to align the measure with the Ombudsman's requirements and definitions so that we don't end up with two versions of the truth and us reporting data on a slightly different basis from the Housing Ombudsman. Um, and then we're proposing two um, satisfaction measures. One, a measure of satisfaction with how the tenants think the landlord is doing on the handling of complaints. Um, and another extra one, which wasn't actually proposed in the white paper itself. Um, we had some feedback from both landlords and tenants when we were doing our preparatory work about the headline complaints measure and the potential for it to be difficult to interpret. Um, so 
For example, if organization X is seeing an increase in the number of complaints, is that because its complaint service is getting better, it's more accessible, it's easier for tenants to make a complaint? Or is it because something's going wrong with its services and therefore there's more that for its tenants to complain about? To try and get to the bottom of that potential ambiguity, we're suggesting having an extra measure um, asking about tenants' knowledge of how to make a complaint. Hopefully that should give us an idea of how accessible and easy to negotiate an organization's complaint service is and give us some information that we can then triangulate against that headline number of complaints and see if we can tease out what it is that's driving any movements. We're proposing three measures under respectful and helpful engagement, all of them tenant perception measures. Um, so the first two are intended to be complementary. So satisfaction that landlords listening to tenants' views and acting on them, and satisfaction that landlords keeping tenants informed about things that matter to them. So the idea there is that we've got two different angles on tenant engagement, one on the flow of information from tenants to the landlord, and another one on the flow of information from the landlord to the tenants. And then a third perception measure on whether tenants feel that the landlord is treating them fairly and with respect. Again, this is an area where we diverge slightly from what was originally proposed in the white paper um, for a couple of different reasons. It was originally proposed that this would be a measure based on the number of complaints. Um, there were a couple of different issues, one of them statistical and one of them slightly more principled. On the statistical side, the issue is that because doing this on a complaint basis would only be a subset of the total number of complaints. There's a potential for them not to be very many cases. So you can end up with quite a small sample, which gives you issues with statistical accuracy and potential volatility. The more principled argument set out by a number of tenants was that if you do it through the complaints system, then that gives the landlord a degree of control over the recording and categorization. Um, of complaints um, and a lot of the tenants that we spoke to felt that there was something a bit odd about doing that because that would then effectively allow the landlord to decide whether it was treating the tenants fairly. So for both of those reasons we're proposing to do this as a perception measure and ask the tenants directly. And then finally under the theme of responsible neighbourhood management um, we're looking at a management information measure on the number of antisocial behaviour cases um, and then three perception measures based on satisfaction with communal areas, satisfaction with the landlord's contribution to the neighbourhood, and satisfaction with the landlord's approach to handling antisocial behaviour. This is the area where it can potentially get a bit tricky to try and get to the bottom of what contribution the landlord is making as compared to those other agencies that I mentioned earlier. Um, and in a lot of cases, whichever measure we choose in this space has potentially got trade-offs involved. Um, so if you try and do it through um, trying to tease out the landlord's contribution, um, it can be a bit tricky to strip out that of other organisations, as I've said. If you just ask about the quality of the neighbourhood, it loses that focus entirely and just makes it slightly more contextual. So there are pros and cons to whichever measure we choose in this space. So this is an area where we asked a slightly more open question than we have in a lot of the other ones where we've gone for a lead option. And we set out multiple different options for how we might ask that question to see what respondents think of it. Well, Rob, can I yeah. just quickly, uh, just a point of clarification on that last slide um, yeah. from um, Veronica. Um, and I think it's referring to your... Um, third bullet point there, um, where it's agreement that the landlord treats tenants fairly and with respect. And I think her point is, uh, surely that's two questions and not one. Um, yes, there, there is an arg argument for that. I and mean, it is something that we have thought about in preparing the consultation. Um, and we recognise that we could have... Um, separated those out and asked a question about whether they're treated fairly and whether they're treated with respect. Um, from some of the kind of preparatory work that we've done um, with kind of sector experts and in particular with um, BMG, um, who we um, procured to provide us with sort of expert advice on um, market research and survey techniques, 
um, we came to the conclusion that the responses to those two separate questions would be likely to correlate with each other pretty closely. So we were unlikely to get radically different results out of it. Um, and the other factor was that we want to try and keep the number of questions reasonably manageable so we don't end up with a, an incredibly long list that might lead to people sort of switching off halfway through and leading to kind of incomplete surveys. So there is a bit of a trade-off in there. I recognize that it is two slightly different, albeit potentially linked concepts. Um, um, but we, yeah, we recognize that's an issue. And um, um, if people want to kind of come back on that and you know, make that point in their consultation responses, you know, by all means do so. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'll just move on then. Um, the next area that we're consulting on um, is the technical requirements um, on how to go about completing the, um, the, um, the TSMs themselves. Um, so we've produced a draft guidance note um, to go alongside the, um, the consultation, which sets out how to go about doing the calculations and it includes all of the information on exactly how you need to set out, out the questions, how you do the calculations and the kind of the underlying rules of the game. So that includes things like the uh, required level of reporting, um, which we're proposing should be the registered group basis, because that's the level that we regulate at. It sets out the properties that are within scope, which are those which are social housing under the terms of the 2008 Act, so low cost rental accommodation and low cost home ownership. Some information on proposed reporting dates and periods, um, and some separate propositions on how to um, manage the process for smaller providers. Um, the basic proposition is that the standard would apply to everybody regardless of size, um, but we recognize that there are potentially issues in terms of um, statistical accuracy, um, capacity, um, and so on and so forth for smaller organizations. So we've set out a series of proposals in there um, on different and, and, and slightly lighter touch um, proposals for small organizations, which we're asking for comment on as well. Alongside that, we're proposing, we're setting out a set of proposed survey requirements for how to do the surveys um, on the tenant perception questions. There's quite a lot in here, so I'll just focus on a couple of the key elements. Um, one of the big issues that I think we're need, going to need to get right um, is how to go about assuring a representative sample of tenants. Um, we recognise this is probably going to need to be a sample-based exercise. It's unrealistic to expect organisations to survey all of their tenants in full every year if they've got 50,000, 100,000 plus tenants. So it will need to be a sample exercise, but we know enough about how different groups of tenants are likely to respond on the basis of differences in geography, tenure type, different demographic factors, but we know that the selection of that sample could potentially bias the results in a particular direction. So we set out some proposed requirements for how to construct a sample to try and make sure that it is representative of the underlying population of each organisation. The other issue that's caused a lot of debate um, while we've been preparing the results is around collection methods. So we know there are a lot of different ways in which people survey their tenants at the moment, face-to-face -face interviews, phone polls, online, and so on. And each of those has got their its merits. Um, so we've had kind of two schools of thought put to us on this. On the one hand, we've had some people say, you need to be really prescriptive. Each of those different methods produces different results. If you don't say exactly how you've got to do this, the results won't be comparable from one organization to the next. On the other hand, we've had people say to us, hang on, which ones are you going to ban? You know, if you're very restrictive, it's going to introduce barriers to tenants. It's going to make it much more difficult to engage people. You might systematically rule out engagement with particular types of tenants. Um, the way we try to square that circle is by proposing that we should permit a range of methods, but we would expect the landlord to set out in detail which ones they had used. So that if needs be, we can identify what methods have been used and try and tease out what impact that might have made to the reported results and therefore the comparability of different organisations. We're producing some very brief guidance on the submission of data. Again, this is short and sweet. 
um, basically sets out that we will be collecting the information and publishing it. Probably the most important thing in there is it sets out the high level principles for how we we're proposing to go about regulating using this data. Uh, we obviously haven't worked that out in the greatest level of detail yet because we still need to define the standards and work out a wider operational approach. But it sets out the principles that we're proposing to follow. Most importantly, we don't intend the TSMs to be the be all and end all of our consumer regulation. We're not just going to reach views on providers' compliance with the standards on the basis of what these numbers show. There will be one regulatory tool, one source of intelligence amongst many, um, and we'll take them into account alongside other sources of information like referrals from the ombudsman, whistleblowing, other sources of data, information that we get from direct engagement with the landlords, um, which will all triangulate um, to try and identify the issues on which we might need to get more assurance from particular organizations. Um, and we've got a couple of bits of supporting documentation and analysis as well. So we've got draft regulatory impact assessment, um, which sets out a range of different alternative implementation options, including the one that we're proposing and a few alternatives that we aren't proposing to follow up, um, and includes our cost estimates um, for how much we think those might cost. Um, our central estimate for our lead option is that we think in NPV terms over the sector as a whole over 10 years, it will cost around 40 million, um, which we think is reasonable um, in the context of a sector that's got a turnover of 30 um, billion pounds a year. Um, and we'll be soliciting views on that as well. So we'll publish a revised version in the light of the feedback that we get from the consultation. And then similarly, um, we are producing an equalities impact assessment, um, which is part of the consultation package, um, which I think is important in this context, given what we know about the reported differences in levels of satisfaction from different groups of tenants, particularly on the basis of ethnicity and basis of age. Um, so we've set out um, some initial analysis of um, our propositions, um, whether we think they've got a positive, negative or neutral impact on groups with protected characteristics under the Equalities Act. Um, and again, we're seeking feedback on that analysis and we will publish a revised version of the UKOIA alongside our final propositions. I say the consultation is now running. Uh, there's just over a month to go um, if you haven't got your responses into us yet. So it closes on the 3rd of March. Um, the easiest way to do it is via the, um, uh, the online questions. Or if you prefer, you can just email them to us um, or um, send them um, by paper to our Leeds office, um, which is now slightly easier than it would have been now that we've got access to the Leeds office again. Um, and finally, um, just a site on where we're going next. So the consultation, as I say, is now live. It's got um, a month and a bit to run and we'll close in March. Um, we'll then go away, um, analyze the responses, consider how we're going to respond to them um, and make any necessary changes to the proposed TSM standard and the rest of the documentation with a view to trying to publish them probably in late summer this year, which would then give both us and the sector the remainder of the, um, the financial year to make the necessary preparations before the requirements come into force on the 1st of April next year. Um, we're looking at doing this as an annual data collection cycle. So the first year's data collection would run from the 1st of April next year through to March the following year, 2024. Um, and we'd then be looking for providers to publish the data and submit it to us shortly after the end of that reporting year. And then once we've collected it all and analysed it, we'll be looking to publish the data at a sector wide and, and an individual provider level later on in 2024. So it's a relatively long timetable, which reflects the, the time needed to do the consultation exercise, make the preparations and actually run the data collection cycle, um, which is one of the reasons why we've moved on the TSMs um, slightly earlier than we have on much of the rest of the, um, the, the um, package on consumer regulation. So that's it from me. Um, and I'm very happy to take any comments or questions. Cheers, Rob. Um, that was a really useful uh, canter through um, 
the whole thing, really, given that, you know, it's, it's quite a big and detailed uh, consultation. I just had my Valium ready just in case we were going to do a line by line review of each uh, definition. But uh, so, no, that was really useful. Unsurprisingly, we've got 71 attendees. So um, there's a few questions. Uh, one of them picks up from the previous question where we've almost got the kind of conflation of, of two potential questions for one. And that um, is raised by a couple of um, uh, people, which is, um, yes, TP04, um, which um, for those that haven't memorized this is satisfaction that the home is well maintained and safe to live in. Yeah. Uh, of course, the points being made is, hang on, that's two questions for the price of one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, again, it's basically the same answer as the last one. We recognise that there are potentially multiple um, different concepts in there. Um, we have chosen to put them together for the consultation exercise, again, on the basis of the judgment that the responses to the two are likely to be fairly closely correlated. Um, and kind of the end result in terms of the outcome um, is relatively... Um, closely connected um this is one of the questions i think where the precise wording of the question is probably very important um and there's a bit more detail in the consultation document that i've included in the um the slide here so there's a bit of a preamble before the um the proposed question which tries to put in some framing statements um making clear that we're talking about the building itself rather than the neighbourhood, for example, to try and make it more clear to the, re the tenant responding what exactly it is that we're talking about. Um, but again, it's one of those areas where there, there is a trade-off between um, trying to capture a range of different things in a single question um, versus splitting it out into multiple questions and ending up with a very, very long list. So we, we, we've tried to strike a balance on that, but again, it is an area where we'd welcome views, particularly on the wording of that one. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Uh, right, I'm gonna crack on through the rest so we can try and give them all an airing. Um, yes, this is about the interface with the existing STAR survey. And so Veronica's asking, are the TSMs likely to take over from the house? Mark questions so uh, what we're going to do about avoiding duplication there with star yeah um we in general we're we're proposing having a call set that will be a a regulatory requirement so um the tsms in their final form post consultation will become a regulatory requirement for all rps both um prps and local authorities so everybody would have to do those as far as possible we try not to reinvent the wheel um, for the sake of simplicity and to avoid, um, again, having multiple versions of the truth out there. So in a few cases, for example, the overall um, he headline satisfaction measure, what we're proposing is pretty closely aligned with what's in STAR already. Um, and then the other thing is that we're not proposing stopping do anyone doing what they're doing at the moment we need to have a kind of a, a core set of measures on a comparable basis for everybody but if organizations want to ask additional questions from you know the star suite or from elsewhere for their own purposes to get additional information on particular issues that are of importance to them that, but don't fall within our required suite we're not going to stop anybody from doing that. Um, so there is still plenty of scope to set the regulatory requirements alongside whatever else you want to do in terms of surveying your tenants for a, the organisation's management purposes. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, and I mean, my own two pennies from what I know about Housemark and Star as well is that, uh, well, clearly you, you've drafted these in conjun conjunction with organisations like Housemark and, uh, uh, you know, with their remit on Star. And so whatever these finalised metrics are, that if you like are aligned to Star, I am sure that what Housemark will ultimately do will, um, will be aligned the star metrics to whatever you guys come up with. Um, so yeah, yeah that, 
Yeah, I mean, right. obviously, it's 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 not for, for for me to say, you know, what what a kind of a third party organisation like Housemark should do. Yeah, you know, our our experience of doing something similar in the space of the value for money metrics is yeah. that we produced a a core suite of mandatory um, regulatory metrics, yeah. which the sector then included within a wider set of measures within the sector scorecard, and you know, where there's overlap with our regulatory measures, they've aligned their definitions with ours, um, whilst having you know, a wider suite of measures that goes beyond our standard minimum requirements. Um, you know, it, it's not impossible that the same thing will happen in this space, but you know, ultimately yeah. that's down to you know, the likes of Housemark to decide. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think having you know, certainly worked for Housemark and worked in this kind of capacity for quite some time, I uh, I think that's exactly what will happen. So I think uh, I think we'll definitely get uh, alignment there uh, in due course. Right, Jonathan's um, following um, the line of uh, the kind of data quality that will need to underpin this, and he's saying. As part of our external audit, our auditors are required to verify the data we report on BFM in our financial statements. Is it envisaged that auditors will have a similar role in relation to TSM data that they publish? Um, we've not set out any specific requirements on verification in the, um, the consultation document. Um, we are including specific requirements in the standard itself, <coughs> sorry, about um, data quality, um, which boards will need to have assurance that they're meeting. So ultimately the responsibility will sit with the board of each organization to be able to assure themselves that they're complying with the standard. Exactly how they go about um, producing that assurance, whether it is some kind of external um, validation exercise or some other, in, other internal is ultimately down to them, but they will need to assure themselves of the quality of the data that they're publishing and submitting to us. Um, and you know, if necessary, we will seek further assurance on whether organizations are meeting that. So there's, there's a basic underlying requirement on the data quality, but we're not being prescriptive about how exactly it should be met. Right, brilliant. And uh, Simon's asking, could you expand on the number of complaints received relative to size of landlord? What yeah. types of figures are you looking at? Um, we don't know yet, um, is the, uh, the key point. So ba basically, we are proposing using the, um, the same definition of complaints as the um, housing ombudsman, so any expression of dissatisfaction, however made. Um, and we are looking at trying to capture that on the same basis um, as the ombudsman in terms of um, stage one, stage two complaints with the same timetable as them. So it will be whatever that pro process on earth for each individual organization in order to try and get at the, um, the size issue and to make it a, a fair comparison. We're looking at doing it sort of per thousand um, properties held um, so that you don't just end up with a, you know, an absolute number, which is inevitably going to be larger for an organization with 100,000 properties compared to one with 1,000. Yeah. property so we're, we're going to try and context what we well, set, set it in the context of the organization size um and um tie it as closely as possible to the ombudsman's definitions to make sure that we don't end up with any inconsistency in what the two organizations are reporting um but other than that i think we, we will just have to wait and see um what comes back in terms of the um the numbers once it's been the exercise has been run and obviously there's an awful lot else go other stuff going on in that space as well with the um um you know the work of the ombudsman and the general push through the white paper to try and make complaints processes more accessible um so by the time this has been um um, introduced you know some of the the context and, uh, and, and the nature of complaint services may have changed a little bit so we will just have to wait and see what the numbers show us yeah and of course it's an interesting one this because it's not strictly speaking a performance measure and i mean if the tsms are about uh, kind of judging landlord performance because obviously performance could be a factor here uh, as in poor performance could be driving a high number of complaints but it could also just be contextual as you said during your slides especially if the outfits uh, kind of pushing its complaints process. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's an important area. It was, it was a big focus of the white paper. Um, satisfaction with the complaint service is a, is a big part of it as well, because obviously it's one of the, kind of the key routes by which tenants can try and get sort of redress and make, make sure that you know their, their needs are being met. So it, it's important in there. Um, but as I said in the kind of presentation, it is an area where there is potential for it to be difficult to interpret what the raw numbers show you, which is why we tried to nuance our propositions a little bit. So we can try and get at whether the numbers are being driven by something about the quality of the service that tenants are getting, or whether it's something about the um, um, the, the nature of the complaint service itself. So we, we tried to get the TSM set up in a way that will give us some information to shed some light on that. But again, this is probably an area where our ultimate regulatory approach will come into play. It's not going to be something that we're going to be able to get to the bottom of purely on the basis of the numbers. Um, you know, if it looks like something of interest is going on with the complaints numbers, it's the kind of thing that we may well end up following up with sort of in person with the organisation and having some more detailed engagement to try and tease out what's going on and what's driving it. Yeah, brilliant. And yeah, nobody should lose sight. It's, it's, it's as Rob said, uh, you know, th these metrics aren't the be all in the end all. Uh, it, it's qualitative engagement will actually get to the quality of services as well. So quick one on repairs, um, which could be summarised as what? No emergency timescale metric. It's, uh, is there a rationale for not including the emergency timescales uh, from the measures? Um yes um it was um in part due to um the dis the distinction in, in in sort of practice on that so um in general our understanding from engagement with you know our investigation enforcement colleagues and the information that we got back during um the cause survey <coughs> is that in general emergency repairs do tend to be done pretty quickly in terms of the time scale um, and including them in a single measure with the repairs service um, well, sorry responsive repairs um, makes it more difficult to compare and kind of skews everything in a, in a particular direction so you can get a slightly clearer picture of what's going on with the, the repair service in general by focusing on non-emergency ones. Um, but again, this is an area that we've kind of toyed with alternative options on and recognise that there are different arguments. And so, you know, it, it falls into the, you know, if you've got particular comments on whether we should include something on that space as well, then you know, feel free to chip it in in the consultation. Right, thank you. And we're back to complaints again. And I, th I think you may have touched on this when you were explaining uh, uh, about complaints uh, and about how you've, uh, you've tried to align with what the Ombudsman is, is saying and how they're defining complaints. But Andy's question is, will complaints be carefully defined? We currently only have accuracy on formal complaints. Complaints that are resolved immediately are not categorised as complaints, but raised and completed as customer contact. Yeah, is that kind of mm -hmm. nipping things uh, in the bud versus formally uh, mm -hmm. sticking it in the system, as it were? Yeah. Um, we're, we're looking at using the ombudsman definition. So it's, a, it's a, the expression of um, dissatisfaction, however made, right. um, for consistency with with, with their de definition. So um, as I said, we, we don't want two versions of the truth out there. So we're, we're looking for what the ombudsman is looking for, basically. Excellent, thank you. Uh, just a quick one in terms of um, the consumer standards in general. Uh, what's your very broad timeline for introduce uh, for reviewing the con the existing consumer standards? Um, we've started doing some initial thought now. It's likely to be a couple of years um, before we're going to be consulting on this. So um, a lot of the more fundamental um, changes to the consumer. Um, um, regime rely on primary legislation. Um, so things like the removal of the serious detriment test, um, the government's committed to trying to find a, a slot to legislate at the earliest practicable opportunity, but hasn't done so yet. So introducing the, the full regime is going to be contingent on that legislation um, and the review of the consumer standards will be linked to that. Um, you know, there's no point in us getting a, 
the consumer standards in place before we've got the ability to fully regulate them. So um, that will be a little while off. We're moving on the TSM slightly faster in part because of the kind of long lead in time that you can you can see on the slide in front of you at the moment um, and in part because it's one of the areas that doesn't rely on legislation. Right, thank you, James. Um, and yes, uh, Peter is picking up the issue around the landlord's contribution to neighbourhood, saying, uh, and you've kind of, you preempted some of this in, in your presentation. It's that thorny issue of the extent to which uh, the tenant has knowledge of who does what on a neighbourhood, but also where a landlord might have a very low mass of properties. Yeah. Um, how... how you know, how can a, a customer actually answer that kind of question? Yeah, and it, I reckon th this is, um, it's a knotty area. And there, there are, I recognise both of the things you said there, Steve. So the different landlords will have a different degree of ability to influence the quality of a neighbourhood if, um, you know, they own the majority of the properties on a particular estate, plus a lot of the amenities and potentially some of the commercial properties, then, you know, there's a significant degree of control if they've just got a few properties pepper potted around um, and most of the, um, the stock is owned by somebody else, then much less so. Um, and it's not always necessarily going to be visible to the tenant either. Mm. So it is a bit of a tricky area. Um, and I don't think that this is one of those issues where there is an obvious that is the perfect question that leaps out at you all of the options that we've considered have got their advantages and disadvantages so one of the options that we put forward in the consultation is one that does try and link it to the landlord's contribution to the neighborhood which has got the advantage that it, it, it sticks to that principle that we set out about trying to attribute the performance to the landlord but it does imply all of the issues that you've just set out about how does the tenant know that landlord X is responsible for things what X, Y, and Z. Um, on the other hand, the alternative we set is just to ask a question about satisfaction with the quality of the neighbourhood, which is much more straightforward. You know, we just have to the tenant given a view on whether or not, you know, they're happy with the neighbourhood that they live in, but loses that link through to the contribution that the, um, the landlord makes. So there's pros and cons of both, and that's why we set out both options um, in the consultation. Um, and you know, um, and we will have to, we'll, see, we'll see which way we go on that, and we'll need to take account of the feedback and the ultimate design of that question, I think, in how we try and regulate this in the long term. Because if you've got a measure that is linked in one way to the contribution of the landlord, um, that implies, I think, taking a slightly different regulatory approach. And if you've got a much broader one, which is, is con contextual um, and would rely much more on, I think, us using direct engagement with the landlord to try and get at the issue rather than focusing on the metric. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a knotty area that probably isn't a perfect right answer on that. And, um, um, we'll be interested to see what people think of it in the consultation responses. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, for, for what it's worth, I, uh, your point about it being one of those things that you tease out more qualitatively uh, with the landlord, you know, particularly for those landlords that will get some kind of consumer inspection. I, I, it is one of those things where you probably need to follow a line of inquiry rather, uh, rather than kind of dream up um, a metric that kind of gets you halfway there or uh, whatever. Right, I'm going to stick with Pete because he's picked um, another thorny, um, another problematic area, which is, uh, you know, customers who've never reported a, an AS, a ASB case mm -hmm. or made a complaint might not necessarily know about the um, association's processes. Yeah. And so how can they really score it? Yeah, um, another, it's a, another valid point. I mean, it is a, a knotty one. Um, there's a bit of a balancing act in here and kind of going back to the, the previous question about sort of formal and informal complaints as well. Um, we've proposed going broad to try and get the opportunity to get responses from people who haven't necessarily you know, gone through the formal process, but may have a view on it. Um, and there's also a bit of a kind of another statistical issue in here that if you um, just focus on the numbers that have 
you know, raised to four more case, then you potentially start getting into the small numbers problem again, and you can end up with relatively small samples, which fall foul of statistical accuracy and can end up being a bit volatile. So we've proposed going the kind of the broad route in the consultation here, um, partly in the interest of, you know, trying to capture um, the, you know, the maximum number of tenants in there, and partly on the grounds of trying to address the statistical issue. Um, but obviously, you're potentially then getting into a kind of pool of people with you know, shallower knowledge um, of the processes. Um, so there's, there's a kind of trade off between kind of depth and breadth um, in that one. Um, you know, we, we've gone one way in the propositions, but, you know, we've heard arguments for, to go in the other way as well. And um, again, it's a, an area that we're very open to receiving feedback on in the consultation. Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, Craig, yes, we will get a, a hold of a set of um, Rob's slides and we'll be sticking them on the website along with the recording of this. Um, just just some specifics about the um, these the. Uh, satisfaction um, survey. Um, I, Francis is asking, can the words your landlord, you know, in the little box bracket, can be, um, can, do, do you have to use that or can you use the actual association's name? And secondly, um, where we're asking questions of those with communal areas, can a filter question um, limit that so so we're not asking everybody the same question yeah on the first one uh i must admit we uh, we got to the end and you've got a question which has stumped me i can't remember exactly what we said in the um um the um the technical guidance note on that i know that it is done the um, name of the organization way sometimes but uh, i have just gone blank on what exactly it is we proposed in the consultation and would need to check um Steve, could you remind me what the second one was? Um, the second one was where you've got a, a question that only affects a certain percentage of punters. Um, you know, can you filter those people out? So you're only asking that question, for instance, of people that have communal areas. Yeah, yeah. So quite quite a lot of the questions have got um, either a filter question, um, for example, on the repairs ones to filter out people that haven't had. Um, a repair in the last year or there is a don't know not applicable uh, there aren't in absolutely every um, question so there are some um, like on the overall satisfaction one where we think that um, realistically everybody is likely to express a view where we we haven't put one in but um, in the majority of cases where it really is likely to be an issue for example on communal areas where you know a lot of people don't have a communal area um, there are either filter questions or not applicables. Right, thank you, Dokes. Um, and just a technical question on the consultation itself from Lee. Uh, is it possible in terms of the online um, response form to just uh, dip in and out, uh, i.e. Yeah. save responses? It is, yeah, you can, so you can save responses. So, um, so we're, do we're doing it through um, uh, Snap, which is um, a piece of software which does have the ability to do that. Right, okay, brilliant. Um, let's have a quick filter. I haven't had a chance to read some of these, so apologies. Um, Lesher is asking, the ordering of questions can sometimes influence how someone answers a question. Will there be guidance around how, where to add additional questions? Will there be a limit to how many additional questions can be added? Um, yes, on the former. So what we're proposing in the consultation is that um, the question that we are asking, so the regulatory question, should come first before any um, related questions on the same sort of domain or issue in order to make sure that all organisations are kind of responding on an equal basis and there isn't the opportunity for people's responses to be influenced by the asking of prior questions on the same theme. So you could put in associated questions on repairs or complaints or whatever it might be but we would expect the regulatory question on that issue to go first um in terms of the number of additional questions we're not proposing any specific limit um but make the general point that um 
the size and kind of maneuverability of a survey is likely to respond affect responses as well so you know, we don't want the questions that we're requiring people to ask um to become too long and unwieldy for the risk of um it being unmanageable and people switching off and not responding to all of them so the same principle would apply to um additional questions asked by the landlord as well um you know by all means add some but you know ha have a view to the overall digestibility of the survey right okay right, thanks and i'm conscious that we're up to our time have you got another 10 minutes at all rob um, um hang on if you give me two seconds minutes. to check my diary yes Brilliant, because um, that would just be great if we could crack through. So I'm going to I'm going to keep going um, because I think it's going to be so useful to people. Um, so Suzanne's just asking, is there a danger of um, survey fatigue? And I guess what she's alluding to here is that uh, so especially if you're a, a big uh, provider where you have to do this annually and uh, it's being suggested uh, uh, every two years for smaller providers. And bearing in mind that 12 of these questions are survey type questions. Yeah. Are we going to tie a tenants out? It's it's something that we thought about, um, and in terms of the proportion of tenants involved, um, we're not proposing anybody being required to do a census, so, uh, other than potentially small providers, where it's the only way of getting a large enough sample. So, for the very big organisations, you could potentially get a large enough sample to give you a. Um, a representative view of the organization without needing to go anywhere near surveying any, everyone so you can get a representative sample with only a relatively small proportion of your total tenant population so you wouldn't necessarily need to sample absolutely everybody so you, individual tenants aren't going to keep getting surveyed year after year after year after year on the same questions potentially um but the other thing is as we've already touched upon is the, is the length of the survey sort of you know fatigue within the exercise as opposed to fatigue over time um and we recognize you know there is a sweet spot in terms of the length of surveys and the number of questions we're proposing now is probably about as much as you would want to include um any much longer than that and people there is a risk that people start switching off so one of the questions we've asked in the consultation is about length of the survey itself and whether people think there are the right number of questions too many too few and so on um but um yeah it, 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 it's a, it's a real issue and it is, is one of the the factors that we've taken into account in producing the guidance um and as we mentioned a couple of times already in the discussion it's one of the factors that we've taken into account where we have bundled more than one concept into a single question because the alternative is uh it's you know splitting out into multiple questions potentially making the survey much longer okie dokes um and th this is a very uh, specific one for some of the smaller providers more uh, maureen's asking uh, as a very small provider we do a star survey every three years uh, we do our three yearly su survey uh, this year 22 to 23 uh, should we wait for the tsms in 23 24 um, because otherwise we won't be surveying until 25, 26. Um, our, our general sort of advice on um, everything regarding consumer regulation is not to wait for us. So um, the, you know, the main issue coming out of the, um, the, the, the white paper about um, you know, transparency to tenants and offering good um service to tenants is not necessarily something that you need to wait for the regulator to put all of its um, measures in place for. Um, it's worthwhile taking a look at what we're proposing in terms of the requirements for um, small providers in the consultation. Um, our core proposition on this is that we'll be looking for um, small providers to do a survey of their tenants once every two years. Um, that's on the basis of kind of discussions that we've had with the sector, including a lot of small provider, the small provider groups in the uh, preparatory phase. So we would be looking for the data from small providers to be no more than two years old at the point at which we would be doing the first data collection. Um, but it, it, again, the um, the propositions on smalls, which include um, 
a number of different aspects in terms of reporting periods, frequency, um, statistical accuracy, privacy, and so on, um, are set out in the consultation. Um, so we haven't pinned those down yet and won't do until we've analysed all of the consultation responses. So it's worthwhile taking a look at those in terms of kind of preparing for what we might do. Um, but also, you know, we welcome responses on um, the, um, the specific proposals that we're making for small organisations. Uh, thanks, Rob. Um, and moving on to Marika and Rosa, they're basically asking the same question about, uh, about this. Uh, do landlords need to create their own survey or will it be a standardised one? Uh, and I think your answer is going to be the consultation document sets out an annex that has the methodological requirements for these surveys. That's right. So we, the, the basic proposal is that um, the, the draft TSM standard um, makes clear that we expect providers to undertake the surveys using the technical requirements set out the annexes that we've consulted on, um, which include which are two documents, one on the general technical requirements for doing the TSMs um, and a second one on survey methodology. And those documents set out in detail how to go about calculating each of the metrics and all of the associated detail. So where it's a tenant perception question, it includes the precise wording of the question that we would expect it to be asked. The response scale, which tenants are within scope and not within scope and all of that kind of detail. So there would be a requirement to follow that those technical guidance notes and that will set out exactly what you need to do for each question. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and again, I think you, you've already made the point that these metrics aren't the be all and the end all, but they, they will kind of guide you in terms of your um, uh, engagement with landlords. So Chris is asking, what action will you take with regard to those landlords who are reporting low rates of ten tenant satisfaction, I'm guessing that you won't kind of give somebody a bad rating just on their satisfaction scores, but it might lead you into asking some questions in terms of your engagement with the yeah. it, It's too early to be definitive at the moment because we haven't um, decided on the shape of the future consumer standards that we, you know, we would be seeking to test compliance against. And we haven't developed the rest of our wider operational approach yet. Um, but in terms of principles, I think the general approach we'll be looking to take would be analogous to what we do on our economic regulation at the moment with a lot of the financial and economic data that we get in from providers. We'll use the, the numbers as a source of intelligence to help us identify which providers we ought to be engaging with. So you just prioritize risk in terms of you know, the organizations, but also to identify the particular issues that we might want to follow up in those organizations. So um, if you know, metric A, B or C looked either you know, poor in absolute terms or going in the wrong direction, that might be an area that we would want to do more detailed follow up on with the provider to find out what's going on under the skin what's driving it, you know, is there something genuine that they should be worried about or is it just a kind of statistical artifact? Um, so it's too early to say definitively, but um, it's likely to be used as a kind of risk prioritization tool in that kind of sense to identify both the providers and the issues that we ought to be focusing our regulatory resource on. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Leonard's got a philosophical question for you about how, um, how the regulator is going to address questions around perception, uh, because obviously these are perception survey questions and perception doesn't necessarily reflect reality. Hmm. Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a blend in here and obviously to, to a certain extent, um, you know, the principle of the white paper is ensuring that tenants are getting the service that they want. So, you know, from, from that kind of standpoint, the underlying um, theory behind the white paper is that, you know, tenant perceptions in themselves are important because, you know, it's the subjective experience of the people living in the properties that matters to them. Um, but equally you know, recognise that um, there can be differences between um, measurable performance data on particular services and of the perception of performance on those, which is why we've got a mixture 
of um, different measures in here. So we've got a combination of management information and the tenant perception information so you can look at the two side by side so for example on um the the stock quality sections there's some um sort of objective and in inverted commas um management information on compliance with the decent home standard um, and some tenant perception um questions on the perceived quality of the accommodation and the repair service to set alongside that so the idea is that we will get a rounded picture which will take into account both the views that are coming from the tenants and the landlord's own management performance information on the same or related issues. So we can look at the two side by side. Brilliant, thank you. And because um, uh, I'm conscious we're really up to our extended time, uh, would you like to just say something about um, uh, the treatment of um, shared owners and leaseholders? Yeah. Um, on shared owners, our basic proposition is that um, they are within the scope of the exercise um, because um, they are social housing under the terms of the, the 2008 Housing and Regeneration Act, which is our sort of founding statute. But we're proposing treating them in a slightly different way. So where there is a large enough number of shared owners in a, um, a given organisation, we'd be looking to have those surveyed separately and reported separately um, from the rented tenants. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, the nature of the relationship between the shared owners and the landlord is different from the relationship between the um, rented tenants and the landlord. So for example, you think that the decent home standard doesn't apply to shared ownership property. Most existing shared owners aren't entitled to a repair service from the landlord. So they're, they're getting a different service and we need to reflect that. And then the other factor is that from what we know about reported satisfaction in the sector at the moment, there's quite a big difference in reported satisfaction between shared owners and general needs and supported housing tenants, which means that if we blurred the two together and bundled them all into one survey, there is a bit of a risk that the numbers end up being driven not just by the quality of the landlord services and the, you know, the, the response of the tenants to that, but by the composition of the landlord's stock. So you, know, you might end up with a, an organisation which has got exactly the same satisfaction for its general needs tenants and exactly the same satisfaction for its low-cost home ownership tenants. But if you've got a much greater number of low-cost home ownership tenants in one or in the other one organization than the other, you still end up with a very different reported headline number. So we're basically we're proposing including both of those, but doing it separately. On leasehold, our remit only extends to social housing. Um, so a lot of leaseholders aren't social housing under the terms of the 2008 Act. So, you know, if they staircase to 100% or exercise the right to buy, um, then obviously there is still a relationship within with the landlord, um, but it's not social housing in the, in the terms which would allow us to regulate it. So um, they are out of scope from the exercise um, simply because of the kind of the legal remit that we've been given by Parliament. Fab. OK, uh, to round things up, just just a quick observation from Peter, which is the the listens and acts um, satisfaction with you know, the landlord listening and acting. Uh, again, it could be a bit of a problematic uh, metric for some landlords where there isn't a huge amount of engagement from their tenants because there just isn't a, a level of engagement. Um, and Veronica just makes the observation that they've been trying to engage their tenants in uh, consultation, in this consultation, mm -hmm. get their feedback and that they're finding it just somewhat difficult because of the technical nature of this. But my understanding is, is all the way through the soft consultation last year and, and, and this formal consultation, that you are consulting bodies of tenants on these metrics anyway. Yeah, we're, we're keen to get the view from both tenants and landlords. And when we um, we wrote out to landlords um, on the launch of the consultation, we encouraged them to engage with their tenants through that. We recognise that it's a, it's a long series of documents and it's, it's necessarily technically complex in places. So um, we've um, produced a plain English summary version, which will hopefully help. Um, we've also now published um, an easy read 
version of the document as well. So there's a couple of alternative versions which may, a, it may be helpful. Um, so we, we did some direct engagement with, with tenants as well as through their representative bodies um, in the preparatory stage. And we're doing some more events with those um, representative bodies throughout the consultation process as well. So um, hopefully we're doing a few things to try and make it easier to engage tenants. And um, um, if you haven't made use of them yet, hopefully those different summary documents will be helpful. Yeah, brilliant. Rob, as always, thanks again for your time uh, and effort. And I, I bet you'll just be so pleased when this is all done and dusted. <laughs> um, so that's great. Um, thanks again. Um, Rob's slides and a recording of this will be available on our website shortly. Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for attending and, and uh, Rob for doing such a comprehensive job uh, and uh, apologise for running over 16 minutes. Um, but thanks, everyone. Okay, Ron. That, thanks again for inviting us and uh, please do respond to the consultation. Cheers, Rob. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.